Well, today is the last day of our series, Roe, the Politics of Life. And to close out the week, we want to highlight some of the ways the pro-life movement is helping pregnant women who are in need. Right now, there are just over 800 abortion clinics across the United States. But what you may not know is that they are largely outnumbered by crisis pregnancy centers. That's right. There are approximately 2,600 facilities equipped with resources for women who choose life. And the New York Times is panicking over this number, saying that if Roe versus Wade is overturned by the Supreme Court, the number of abortion clinics could dwindle. And they point out that more than half of the women who are of reproductive age would live closer to a crisis pregnancy center than to an abortion facility. Well, joining us now to tell us why that's a good thing, Vice President of Strategic Relationships at Human Coalition, executive producer of the pro-life documentary, Divided Hearts of America, and former tight end for the New England Patriots, Benjamin Watson. Benjamin, it's so good to see you. Thank you for coming on uh, with us to talk about this important issue. You know, your group, Human coalition, they point out something very fascinating, that there are roughly one million abortion-determined women in the U.S. every year. And you all help service some of those pro-life pregnancy centers, 45 to be exact, I think, and growing. But you also have created a new type of life-affirming center called a women's care clinic, which I do want to talk to you about in a minute. But what are you seeing when these women are coming to these crisis pregnancy centers for help? I mean, what is the reason that they're having abortions? Well, what we're seeing is that 75% of these women who are abortion determined would prefer to parent if those circumstances were different. And so what we've done at Human Coalition and what so many other pregnancy resource centers around the country have done is say, you know what? We want to provide for you in your time of need, whatever it is, whether it be food, clothing, shelter, whether it be employment, education, uh, there are a number of reasons why a woman feels that like she needs to abort. But also what we found is that to, to a woman, they all would like to parent if something were different. So how do we stand in the gap for them? I think that that's the, the overarching question that we have to ask ourselves right now, especially as we're on perhaps the cusp of a post row generation here in America, is how do we as a pro-life movement not only fight for legislation, but also fight for thriving for men, women, and these pre-born children for whatever their needs may be. You know, when I think about the abortion industry, they're pretty pur purposeful about targeting uh, these women and exploiting them to make them believe they, that's really their only option and it's such an easy option to them. Um, but what you all do, I love what you all do at Human Coalition because as you were just talking about, you have a very holistic approach in these um, resource centers I was talking about. So what is different that you all do? Well, I think that everybody has their place. And Human Coalition, we're not in competition with anyone. If anything, we seek to support and join and, and have a coalition of, of pro-life organizations and individuals because we truly believe that everybody has a lane, everybody has, to use the football term, a role to play when it comes to standing for life. And we want to lift and elevate other organizations and what they do best. Uh, we've truly uh, found uh, very specific and dynamic ways to target ad words. When women search for abortions, we're able to have them call our, our care centers, speak to our nurses, speak to our technicians, and connect them with local pregnancy resource centers in their areas. But we also do legislation. And so we are one of the only organizations that uh, are involved in state, local, federal legislation because we understand that the law is very important. We have to have laws, legislation that uplifts and protects life. But we also, as we've talked about before in this interview, we also have to provide for the real, apparent, and necessary, immediate needs of mothers who are carrying children. You know, when I think about the narrative that's happening right now, it's about women's choice. But interestingly enough, it takes a woman and a man to make a baby. And a lot of times men get left out of this conversation. I know that you have said fatherhood starts in the womb. How do you reach out to young men and encourage them to step up, to, to be bold and brave? Yeah, there's 46 chromosomes, 23 and 23. So anytime that a man is taken out of the equation, he clearly, as you said, has half the responsibility and needs to live in that. Uh, I think that it's imperative for men to challenge other men. Uh, what I've seen, even in my conversations with, with men on fatherhood, many dads want to be good dads. They fall a victim to the same lie that is coming out, this lie about not being uh, involved, that you don't have to be involved, that it's not your place to stand in the gap. There are many men who are actually hurting because they've lost their children to abortion. And so these this stain of abortion, in my opinion, uh, will stay with us until men stand up and men are held accountable primarily by other men because we have a role to play and we need to play that role to, to our best of our ability. 
Yeah, and I think it leaves a lot of men confused when it feels like it's just all about the women's choice and they don't know. They feel like, I want to support a woman, uh, but they don't know how. So I appreciate what you do to stand up for men and encourage them to speak up. Uh, lastly, I do want to ask you about this because you came out with a documentary during COVID, Divided Hearts of America, and it's so well worded because it is divided hearts. We're so divided on this issue and it's become, I mean, it's always been heated, but it's more heated than ever, especially with uh, the anticipation that Roe will likely be overturned. How do you approach having these tough and hard conversations? I think we have to lead with, with empathy. And so much of what we hear is extreme right or extreme left. We rarely hear about the humanity of people involved. And I'm not just talking about the humanity of the child in the womb, also the humanity of the mother. Uh, we have to talk about the humanity of people that don't agree with us. I mean, we have to be people who are willing to bridge that gap. And so when it comes to uh, having the conversation, we have to enter this conversation with courage. Uh, we have to let down our guard sometimes. We have to see that some people, um, although they stand on the other side of the aisle, uh, they care about life. How do we coalesce with them? How do we challenge each other? But also, how do we love? Um, love is not just an emotion. Love is not just a funny feeling. Love is an action. And what love does is it makes us seek the best for the other person. So how do we provide for the woman that is in crisis? How do we meet her needs? How do we, even if it's outside of our political platform, how do we say, you know what, we have to provide a larger safety net for these women in order for them to be able to choose life? Uh, we have to start there, um, but we are divided. I still have hope, but it's gonna take people who are like-minded, people who care about life to stand in the gap, especially as we go into this next phase of Roe uh, being struck down, which I believe it should be struck down and, and all hopes and all signs point to it being that way. Mm. Benjamin Watson, thank you for what you're doing to inject truth into this conversation. And I think it's so important to have that aspect of love and compassion because there's so many people out there who have had abortion, who've been affected by abortion. And a lot of people have been fed a lie. Um, and so we have to approach it in that way. And I really appreciate what you're doing, what you're doing at Human Coalition. And thanks for sharing with our audience here today. Thank you. Thanks for having me.